Hi, my name is Melissa Lem. I'm a family physician and the president-elect of CAPE, and I'm also an active member of BC CAPE. And we thought that to start off this talk, it would be a good idea to give some context to what's going on in terms of health. Now, I know a lot of the people here are probably within BC, so I thought what we would do is give, a, give some context on, on what's happening in Canada with climate change, the health effects we're already seeing, and then sort of take a deeper dive into BC to see what exactly we can expect and how exactly we can prepare. Because as a family physician, I'm always thinking, what's, what's the most practical thing I can do? What exactly can I prepare for? So I thought it'd be useful to share some of these ideas with you today. So a lot of us are familiar with this concept of um, cl oops, a climate change being either, uh, you know, being the greatest health threat of the 21st century, according to the World Health Organization, or and acting on climate change being the greatest opportunity in terms of all the different health effects and positive effects that we can if we take action. And within Canada, we are already see seeing some of the effects of climate change from wildfire related asthma and evacuation to impacts of availability of traditional foods and mental health in, in the north to allergies to tick borne disease and health related illness to displacement from other countries. Um, Canada is already exp experiencing the effects of climate change. And my question is what's happening in BC like what kind of action are we taking here and in fact BC's carbon emissions have actually increased 10% in the last three years despite announcing a target in 2008 that by 2030, we would be 40% below our 2007 targets. And as most of us know, most of the greenhouse gases in BC are produced by the energy sector. And within our province, expansion of the LNG or fracking industry plays a significant role. And I really wanna point out here that unlike what industry is trying to convince some of us is that liquefied natural gas is not a transition fuel. It's primarily composed of methane, which is a super pollutant with 84 times the warming potential of carbon dioxide over the next 20 years, which is the critical period in which we need to reduce our emissions. So expanding fossil fuel infrastructure within BC and within Canada makes it impossible for us to reach our carbon emissions reduction target. So we have to start, we have to start phasing it out now. Now I'm gonna start in terms of speaking about the health effects um, with the three highest climate related risks that we are going to see that are projected by researchers for us to see. So the first one is asthma and evacuations from wildfires. So a lot of us here remember there were record breaking BC wildfires from 2017 to 2018. And this past summer, we experienced a lot of air pollution from smoke drifting up from the west coast of the US. So in 2017 to 2018, the area burned was seven to 11 times larger than it would have been without climate change. And in terms of why we're seeing this, drier, hotter summers results in drier soils and vegetation, which burn more easily. And every one degree Celsius increase um, increases lightning strikes by 12%, which is also a major contributor to forest fires within BC. Also, because we're not having those cold winters, mountain pine beetles don't die off as easily, and so they spread. And so essentially they're killing off our forests in Northern BC and making it easier for them to burn. Research also shows that ambulance calls for cardiac and respiratory events increase significantly after one hour of smoke exposure and calls for type two diabetes increase within 48 hours, a reflection of inflammation. And research also shows higher rates of PTSD, anxiety and depression in wildfire evacuees. And in terms of who's at the most risk for smoke exposure, that would be children, the elderly, pregnant women, patients with diabetes and those with heart and chronic lung diseases. So what we wanna make sure we do as healthcare professionals is to make sure patients are educated about the air quality health index. We want to make sure that our vulnerable populations have portable HEPA air filters in their homes. And we want to make sure that they have up to date COPD and asthma action plans and make sure that their inhalers are refilled early before wildfire season. The second risk I want to talk about is that related to water and food security. So if we continue with business as usual, it's estimated that climate change um, will cause a, will increase our risk of a one in 500 year flood event of the Fraser River by making it five times more likely by 2050 and affecting greater than 30% of BC's population, which would essentially have a catastrophic effect on our economy. And this will disrupt our airport. And this will also disrupt our food transport chains from the US, because if you think about it, a lot of the food that's trucked up from the US has to come through Richmond, which is very low lying. And something that came up during a chat I had with a Vancouver city councilor and Seth, this wasn't Christine. Um, he just casually mentioned that there were these let go areas in the city of Vancouver that we could expect by 2100 due to 
uh, sea level rise. And he said these were these included Spanish banks, Locarno, Musqueam, False Creek, and the River District, which are all places where I'd love to go walking with my family. And the thought that in you know by 2100, when my child is is older, that he might not be able to walk in these areas and people might not be able to live in this in these areas is is pretty alarming to me. Um, we're also going to see high risk of water shortages uh, less than every two years by 2050. And this will affect our drinking water. This will affect our ecosystems, agriculture, and tourism. Also, it's estimated that our glaciers in our mountains will decrease 30 to 50% by 2050. Again, if we don't reduce carbon emissions and just continue with business as usual. And this will reduce our river water for agriculture and power and industry. Now, in terms of risks from these water events, um, we have increased risk of flood in the lower mainland and coastal areas and increased risk of drought in South Central BC. So in terms of action to take, I mean, this is, this is pretty awful. Um, the main action we can take is essentially fight to reduce our carbon emissions to our Paris Agreement targets. But in terms of small things that we can do on a local scale, we can encourage local food gardening and water storage for when those water shortages happen. The third risk I want to talk about is heat related illness. So in fact, within BC, we have been seeing increased mortality from extreme heat events since 2009, in fact. So BC is warming faster than the rest of the world, just on track with Canada. So for example, heat deaths in Southern Canada increased, are projected to increase 100% by 2050. And the average BC temperature, again, under those business as usual uh, scenarios, will increase up to 4.5 degrees Celsius by 2100. Now, in terms of where we predict the most death will happen from heat illness, the highest absolute mortality will happen in the lower mainland because there are just more people here. But the highest relative mortality is predicted to happen on the coast and in the north because those aren't populations that have historically been prepared for extreme heat. Um, and there will be lower than expected mortality in the dry plateau, again, because they're used to, to high heat and already have, have uh, preparations in terms of air conditioning and cooling centers available. Now, in terms of who's at increased risk from heat-related illness, that would include the children, elderly, socially isolated, and people of lower socioeconomic status. So what we wanna do is make sure that we identify and counsel those at-risk patients about heat safety. Now, in terms of impacts on traditional foods and territories, we are really going to see this affecting our indigenous peoples within BC. So it's estimated that climate change related declines in marine species traditionally harvested by coastal First Nations will decrease their essential nutrient intake by 21 to 31% by 2050. What's also happening with, within BC that I wanna point out is that resource extraction projects are disrupting access to traditional lands and practices. So for example, the coastal gas link pipeline that is currently being built through Wet'suwet'en ter territory without their consent, disrupted access to the Unistotin Healing Center. So, I mean, essentially environmental racism for, for centuries has situated industry close to um, or, or right through indigenous territories and, and other marginalized peoples within our country. So in terms of what we have to do to prevent this from happening is give them as much support as we can both publicly and, and in any other ways we can think of. Now, I mean, this might be a little bit of a bright spot um, in terms of in terms of health impacts, if you can call it a bright spot in terms of health impacts within BC for climate change. So um, essentially, increased heat increases our environmental exposure to aero allergens and air and also air pollution increases uh, the incidence of allergies and asthma. Now, in terms of Vancouver, we've seen a slight increase in total pollen, pollen counts over the last 22 years compared to dramatic increases in Toronto and Montreal. And this is the, the reason is because we already have a long pollen season. So ours lasts from January to August compared to March to August for um, compared to Ontario and Eastern Canada. But that said, higher temperatures do tend to extend the pollen season. And for example, ragweed emits two times the pollen in higher carbon dioxide environments. So we still have to think about this. So what we want to do is we want to have a high index of suspicion regarding allergies when our patients present with respiratory and rash complaints. And I also want to talk about tick-borne diseases. This is something I often wonder about. You hear about rising rates of Lyme disease in the rest of the country. So Good news is that Lyme disease rates are lower and a bit more stable than in the US and Eastern Canada. And there are a couple of reasons. So the first one is that the tick species carrying Lyme disease in BC are different. So here we have Ixodes pacificus and Angustus, which uh, carries Lyme disease less than Ixodes scapularis, which is the primary tick uh, population in Eastern Canada. 
Also, these exodus ticks are present in highly populated southern and central BC. And as climate change increases the range and makes it spread north, this range expansion isn't going to greatly expand the number of exposed people. So therefore, in BC, rapid expansion of Lyme disease is unlikely by 2050. However, we should still educate ourselves and our patients on Lyme disease symptoms, treatment, and prevention. And finally, in terms of health effects, I want to talk about relocation and displacement. So Canada's own government has created reports that predict that we're going to see significant internal displacement from wildfires, coastal sea level rise, and drought. And in fact, Canada admitted the largest number of the world's resettled refugees in 2018 and say that our best estimates suggest that hundreds of millions of people could be on the move in the coming decades due to the impacts of climate change. So for example, the 20, 2006 to 2010 drought in Syria was one catalyst to the ongoing war that began in 2011. So what we need to do is educate ourselves on refugee health because as a country that accepts a lot of refugees, we're, we are very likely going to see many, many from other nations. I just want to mention some quick practice greening tips also, things that you can do in your own office. So one fairly high impact measure that you can take is prescribing dry powder inhalers instead of metered dose inhalers. And the reason is that the propellant in, in the MDIs actually emit greenhouse gases, including norfluorine, which is 1,430 times more potent than carbon dioxide at warming. So each dry powder inhaler you switch to actually saves the equivalent of 150 to 400 kilograms of carbon dioxide per year, which is similar to the carbon footprint reduction of cutting meat from your diet. So if you use inhalers or prescribe them, please consider making this change. We can also choose wisely. Um, our healthcare system is a major source of carbon emissions within our country. So the less that we um, order labs and order tests and interventions, the lower our carbon emissions will be. You can also do simple things like unsubscribing from paper journals, leverage your EMR to cut down on paper, and reduce single-use items by laundering and autoclaving reusable ones instead. Now, I just want to quickly mention COVID-19 and climate change. So climate change is a risk amplifier. And heat stress and wildfires and air pollution increase inflammation, which we know is um, the major source of uh, disease causing, like the pathway that COVID-19 causes all of its different health effects. And so basically, these factors affect virtually all of our social determinants of health. And they increase the burden, the burden on our healthcare system that's already being taxed by COVID-19 and the opioid crisis. So we can't afford to let it progress more. Now, the question is, again, like, what can we as health professionals do about it? And CAPE actually created a climate change toolkit for health professionals and released it in 2019. And as you can see, it's full of different practical information and um, tips on, on how we can take action. So from the science behind climate change to agreements globally, to how to take action on climate change at healthcare facilities and prepare for climate change in our communities and also how to advocate as health professionals. It's, it's a really useful source for healthcare professionals in general. So I'd encourage you to go to our website, cape.ca and take a look at it. Also, in summer of 2020, during the thick of the pandemic, CAPE released a healthy recovery report thanks to the, the hard work of its staff and some of its board and members. And essentially it detailed 25 different recommendations um, for policy changes and actions that could be taken. Um, for example, in decarbonizing our energy, our transportation, our buildings, our healthcare system, and protecting and connecting to nature that will both help us hit our Paris Agreement targets and um, save over 100,000 lives between 2030 and 2050 and create 1.5 million good, clean jobs. Um, so essentially, again, I would encourage you to, to take a look at our website. And this is just one pathway towards hitting our Paris Agreement targets. And something else I want to mention too, given the topic of this talk, is that we also use that World War II framing. So um, we essentially said that the Canadian government is undergoing a mobilization of resources and spending unlike anything we've seen since World War II. So now's the time to take charge and take action against climate change as we decide where these funds are going to go. Like your hosts, I am joining you with gratitude from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil -Waututh nations, otherwise known as Vancouver. Um, I've been asked to give well, an opening mini speech about the, the book. Um, and then I'm looking forward to lots of time uh, for discussion with you all. Um, let me first say uh, how happy I am to have been asked to do this by CAPE. I'm, uh, I'm a longtime fan of CAPE and I deeply appreciate that you folks exist and that you are doing what you are doing. The, the, the climate crisis, as Melissa said, and you all know, 
is also a health crisis. It represents a profound threat to health and safety and mental health and well-being for tens of millions of people. And, uh, it, you know, in addition to all of the examples that Melissa gave just this week, as, as many of you saw probably, a new report from Harvard and a number of other universities pegged the number of premature deaths due to the burning of fossil fuels at, at uh, 8.7 million in 2018 alone. But my talk isn't going to detail the nature of the threat. You, you folks know that already. You, you know the drill. Um, but we also know uh, that the authoritative voice of health professionals is so important to sounding the alarm. Um, you know, M Melissa talked about the things that you can do within your own practices and within the healthcare system, and that's very important. Equally, if not more important, is your voice uh, uh, engaged in this political moment in which we find ourselves. And that, you know, the authority that you bring to it has surely been driven home in this pandemic. And we knew that already. You know, um, looking, looking back in recent years, Probably, this, not probably, the single most significant policy in Canada in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions to date has been the elimination of coal-powered electricity in Ontario. Um, and when that, you know, fight was won, uh, the, the, the role of health professionals making the health case for phasing out coal-powered electricity was key to winning that fight. Um, so we need your voice. And I hope that my book can better equip you in the task of our lives that we are now needing to undertake. And that can also provide a helpful framework as we all press uh, our political leaders for true emergency action. Uh, this is my book, by the way, A Good War, Mobilizing Canada for the Climate Emergency. I, I, I believe that my book calls on us to adopt an entirely new and different approach to the crisis than the one that we've pursued to date. And what I've tried to do is, on the one hand, tell the truth about the severity of the crisis uh, that we face, but those who've read the book are, are also reporting that it is an unusually hopeful book. And its original twist, as has been alluded to, and as the title suggests, is that the book is, in, is structured entirely around lessons from the Second World War. Let me say right off the bat that there is no small irony in me coming to this place and like many of you, I wrestle with the war analogy. My, my own political activism started as a teenager in the peace and disarmament movement in the 1980s. And, and I, am, I am the child of Vietnam War resistors. That is how I happen to be Canadian. Uh, but I am now strongly of the view that climate breakdown requires a new mindset to mobilize all of society and galvanize our politics and to fundamentally remake our economy. And here's why. Um, we need a new approach because what we have been doing in response to the climate crisis so far simply isn't working. Despite decades of calls to action and promises and pledges, our emissions are not on a path to stave off our horrific future for our children and future generations. We have run out the clock with distracting debates about incremental changes, but where it matters most, actual GHG emissions, we've accomplished uh, precious little. So, you know, the, the saying goes that politics is, is all about compromise and the art of the possible, but there is no bargaining with the laws of nature. And nature is now telling us something fierce. And so here we all are, all of us who follow this stuff and what the science says, confronting this harrowing gap between what the science says we have to do and what our politics seems prepared to entertain. Now, I didn't actually start off planning to write a war story. Um, my book project began uh, as an exploration of how we tackle that gap, of how we can align our politics and economy in Canada on the one hand with what the science says we must urgently do to address the climate emergency. And, and the book is that. Um, but initially, I, I had only planned to include a single chapter on lessons from the Second World War because I'd long been intrigued by uh, World War II is an example of rapid economic transformation. But as I delved into that research, I began to see more and more parallels between our wartime experience of mobilization and the current crisis, and ultimately decided to structure the entire book around those lessons. Again, not because I get all weirdly animated about war, but rather because I see in the history of our wartime experience 
a helpful and indeed hopeful reminder that we have done this before. We have mobilized in common cause across society to confront an existential threat. And in doing so, we have retooled our entire economy twice, in fact, once to ramp up military production, another time to reconvert back to peacetime, all in the space of six years. So the book explores what wartime scale climate mobilization could actually mean and look like. And each chapter is kind of one third history, two thirds present. It jumps back and forth in time between stories of what Canada did in the war and what we now face. And in those comparisons, it, it answers questions like, how has public opinion rallied to support mobilization in the war? How might it be galvanized again today? What was the role of government, news media, arts and culture? How was social solidarity secured across class and race and gender? Can we do that again? How was national unity established across Canada's many provinces with their varying interests? And can we successfully achieve that again as we move off fossil fuels? How did we marshal all of our resources to produce what was needed? How do we do that again? How did we pay for the transformation? And can we mobilize the necessary finances once again? Interestingly, what supports were offered for returning soldiers? And is there a model there for just transition for fossil fuel workers today? What was the role of indigenous people in the war? And what is it in today's transformation? What was the role of youth in social movements then? And what is it today? Importantly, what are the war's cautionary tales? The warnings of things that brought us shame, the internments, the squashing of civil rights, the poisoning of indigenous lands. And, and, and Melissa was, was uh, speaking to this, perhaps most apt to the current crisis, the response to refugees. So what were those things that we don't want to repeat? And so those are the kinds of questions that, it, that the book answers, but running through it all is, is what sort of political leadership do we require to see us through challenges like this. And I want to start with one important comparison that I make because it gives me some hope. And it's this, which is that despite Canada's war declaration in September of 1939, it's worth recalling that even as the winds of war gathered in the late 1930s, our leaders and most of the public were reluctant to rec recognize what would ultimately be necessary. A lot like today. Canada was on the cusp of being completely transformed by its Second World War experience. Yet right up to the 11th hour, our governments and most of the public still hoped to avoid being dragged into that fight. And, you know, I feel like that's where we find ourselves today in this awkward period where, you know, the summer before last and the federal, the federal government passes a climate emergency motion in the House of Commons one day, and then proceeds with reapproving the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion the very next day. That's a dynamic that I call the new climate denialism at play. And, that, and it's a concept that I unpack in the book. But as with the Second World War, I'm convinced that this phony war period that we find ourselves in today isn't gonna last. And that in fact, it's about to end. I wanna take a couple minutes just to speak about the lessons I see from this pandemic experience. Um, first off, appreciate how awkward the timing of my book was. I wrote the book before the pandemic. I thought we needed an historic reminder of how quickly we have transformed society and our economies. I shipped the book off for final copy edit three, door, three days before the first lockdown. And then lo and behold, here we all are living that kind of change in real time. The challenge, of course, is that the pandemic has for the last year pushed the climate emergency off the front burner. And that's unfortunate because it's worth remembering that prior to the pandemic, the climate mobilization was really starting to gain some some some, some solid momentum, uh, thanks especially to the, the global youth-led climate strikes as well as to extreme weather events. But the pandemic has also taught us some important and valuable lessons that I think we now need to seize on. And, and there's, there's just so many similarities between our wartime emergency experience and the pandemic response. In both cases, things that seemed politically and economically off limits become newly possible. Uh, and in contrast to our government's hollow proclamations on climate, we have now been forcefully shown, ah, you know, this is what emergency looks and feels like. The status quo is suspended. Government leaders and public officials hold daily emergency briefings. 
government cabinets form emergency committees of key ministers like they did in the war. Resources and personnel are redeployed. Manufacturing capacity is requisitioned to produce essential, to produce essential products. Uh, governments assume power over and direct necessary supply chains. Public facilities are repurposed as needed. And of course, we honor those on the front line. And the news media and journalists too have really risen to the occasion in the pandemic, right? Quickly retooling their kitchen tables in the early days so that they could continue to provide vital public information and rally our, our collective morale from their homes. And in a really interesting and welcome shift from what has marked climate reporting, in this pandemic crisis, the media for the most part seems to feel no obligation to give credence and equal space to those who question the scientific evidence. I think we also have come to understand that the vulnerable must be urgently lo looked after or we are all more vulnerable to this invisible foe. The emergency response to protect the most vulnerable has of course been far from perfect, but the pan and the pandemic has revealed and exacerbated all, all the existing inequalities in our society. But now at least we seem prepared to recognize and begin to repair these interlocking fissures. And, and just as social solidarity was vital for wartime mobilization in the war, so it has been in this crisis, right? And our displays of that solidarity have been beautiful at times in this crisis. And, you know, of course, just like in the war, a minority of people responds, you know, in selfish or antisocial ways, but those are the exceptions. The large majority of us have shown our best selves and we've heeded the instructions of public health officials and we've organized mutual aid networks and we've looked after our housebound neighbors and we've stayed calm and entertained our children and we've cooperated. And as in times of war, our governments at every level have appropriately dispensed with the fetishization of balanced budgets and they're spending what's required, you know, defi deficits be damned. The, the extraordinary public spending now underway in response to the pandemic merely shows what we could have done all along in response to the climate emergency or poverty or homelessness. It turns out when our governments recognize an emergency, the money was always there. The curse of the climate crisis, it turns out, is that in comparison to the pandemic and the war, it moves in slow motion and, and thus has failed to galvanize us, at least so far. The COVID pandemic has reaffirmed the role and value of ambitious government action. Social solidarity and support for public services is probably at a generational high. There's a new spirit of national and cross-partisan cooperation in our land that we now need to capitalize on. The public's going to emerge from the COVID crisis with new respect for scientists and scientific evidence. We collectively now understand that the more an economy is localized, the more resilient we are to disruptions. And the economic recovery that we're going to need requires public investment. So you combine all of these realities and they provide key ingredients for the climate emergency mobilization that now needs to get underway. And after 40 years, of a neoliberal agenda that has, I think, as its most insidious legacy, the sapping of our sense of possibility and our collective faith in our capacity to undertake great tasks together. The pandemic has shown us how quickly that we're capable of changing and, and how swiftly we can throw out the rule book. And so in some important ways, I think our sense of imagination is restored. Let me shift gears a little bit here. Since releasing my book in September, um, pretty much every interview I've done, I, I, I get asked, how do you know when a government gets the emergency? And so I've, I've, the question has forced me to try to distill a 400 page book into what, what are, I now call my four markers for when you know that a government has shifted into emergency mode. And when we move into q and I'll, I'll post a link to a short piece I wrote that has these four markers so you don't need to remember them, but here's what they are. This is when you know that a government has shifted into an emergency mode. One, it spends what it takes to win. Two, it creates new economic institutions to get the job done. Three, it shifts from voluntary and incentive-based policies to mandatory measures. And fourth, it tells the truth about the severity of the crisis and communicates a sense of urgency about the measures 
that are necessary to combat it. Now think about those four things. During the Second World War, the Canadian government did all of those things. And likewise, in response to the pandemic, I would say the Trudeau government passes all four markers. You know, we can quibble about the specifics, but they're on all four. But with respect to the climate emergency, thus far at least, our current federal and every provincial government are failing not on one of some of those counts, they're failing on all four counts. So I want to want to take a few minutes to explore each of these four markers with you, along with a, a few other key lessons um, that I draw from our Second World War experience. The book in the book, I, I group all of the lessons from the Second World War into what I call the battle plan for climate mobilization. It's a 14 point plan. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through all 14 points because that would take too long. But I want to highlight a few, starting with those four markers. So marker number one, spend what it takes to win. A, a benefit of an emergency mentality is that it forces governments out of an austerity mindset and it liberates the public purse. This year, in response to the COVID emergency, Canada's debt to GDP ratio is going to rise from about 30% to 50%. Now that's a big jump in a single year. But at the end of World War II, it was more than double that, well over 100%. And when C.D. Howe, who was the minister who oversaw all of Canada's wartime military production, when he was pressed about government spending in the war, he famously replied, if we lose the war, nothing will matter. And in order to finance that war effort, the government instituted new public victory bonds and new forms of progressive taxation were instituted. In fact, uh, it's interesting to note, included in those was a, a cap on profits. The, the kind of profiteering that we've seen in this pandemic was illegal in the Second World War. And I think as we confront the climate emergency, we're going to need similar kinds of tools. Federal spending and provincial spending on climate action and green infrastructure pales in comparison to both the war and the pandemic response. The Trudeau and Horgan governments aren't merely spending a little less than they should in the face of the climate emergency. They are spending less by a probably a tenfold order of magnitude. Marker number two, create the economic institutions needed to get the job done. So during the Second World War, starting from a base of virtually nothing, the Canadian economy and its labor force pumped out a volume of military equipment at speed and scale that is simply jaw dropping. During six years, Canada with a population less than a third what it is today, produced 800,000 military vehicles, more than Germany, Italy, and Japan combined, 16,000 military aircraft, ultimately building the fourth largest air force in the world at the time. And here in our province, just in our province of BC, where most of you are, although not all of you, where we seem to be unable to, you know, we struggle to build a single BC ferry anymore. We produced over 300 ships, again, from a base of virtually nothing. And remarkably, the Canadian government, under the leadership of C.D. Howe, created 28 new crown corporations to meet that supply and munitions requirement of the war effort. Howe, you know, Howe was no lefty, just to be clear, um, but he was seized with the task. So he was happy to give contracts to the private sector, but he was in a hurry. And any time the private sector couldn't quickly do what needed doing, he created another crown corporation. His department also undertook detailed economic planning to ensure that wartime production was prioritized. Um, you know, again, we've had an interesting taste of this with the pandemic on the issue of vaccine manufacturing, right? One of the reasons I fixate on the need for crown corporations is in the absence of crown corporations, the best we can do is try to incentivize somebody else to do what needs doing instead of just doing it ourselves, which is probably what we should have done a year ago when it came to vaccine production. Similarly, during the pandemic, though, with the exception of that vaccine question, I think we've witnessed the federal government create these audacious new programs like the CERB and the wage subsidy with a speed that few of us would have predicted. But in response to the climate emergency, we've seen nothing of the sort. So in contrast to C.D. Howe's wartime creations, the Trudeau government has established two new crown corporations during its time in office, the Canada Infrastructure Bank, which is basically a privatization vehicle for infrastructure. And you know what the second one is? It's the Trans Mountain Pipeline Corporation, the one that makes us all the proud owners of a 60-year-old pipeline. If our government really saw the climate emergency as an emergency, it would, like C.D. Howe did, 
quickly conduct an inventory of our conversion needs to determine how many heat pumps, solar arrays, wind farms, electric buses, we're gonna need to electrify virtually everything and end our reliance on fossil fuels. And then it would establish a new generation of public corporations to ensure that those items are manufactured and deployed at the requisite scale. Marker number three, shift from voluntary and incentive-based policies to mandatory measures. Now, as, as, as I explained earlier, and, and as Melissa showed you over the last 20 years, we have not managed to lower our emissions. Now, why is that? I think a major reason is that if you survey our federal and provincial climate actions to date, they're almost entirely voluntary. We encourage change, we incentivize change, we offer rebates, we send price signals. What we have decidedly not done is require change. If we're gonna meet the GHG targets now set out by the IPCC that we must meet, we need to set clear near-term dates by which certain things will be required. So for example, we would declare that you, you will no longer be able to purchase a new fossil fuel vehicle as of 2025. We would say all new buildings will not be permitted to use natural gas or other fossil fuels for heating as of next year. We would ban the advertising of fossil fuel cars and gas stations, right? The health professionals led the charge to ban tobacco advertising because it's bad for our health. Now we need you to lead the charge to ban fossil fuel vehicle advertising. That's how we make clear that this is serious. And marker number four, tell the truth and rally the public at every turn. So many of us assume that at the outbreak of the Second World War, everyone understood the threat and was ready to rally. And you know what? Turns out that's not true. It took leadership to mobilize the public. In frequency and tone, in words and in action, the climate emergency needs to look and sound and feel like an emergency. And the leaders that we most remember from the Second World War were these outstanding communicators who were forthright with the public about the gravity of the crisis, and yet they still managed to impart hope. And their messages were amplified by a news media that knew what side of history they wanted to be on, and by an arts and entertainment sector that was keen to rally the public. Similarly, that's how our present governments have modeled emergency communications in the pandemic, right? The messages are ubiquitous. We receive daily press briefings. We hear regularly from public health officials. The media has taken seriously its duty to provide necessary information on a daily basis. Government leaders and media have listened to health experts and science and have acted accordingly. None of that consistency and coherence, however, is present with respect to the climate emergency. When our governments don't act as if the situation is an emergency or worse, when they send contradictory messages by approving new fossil fuel infrastructure like LNG in our province, they are effectively communicating to the public that it's not an emergency. And my, my view is, is that if our current leaders believe they face an emergency, they need to act and speak like it's a damn emergency and name it, speak about it continually and rally us at every turn. That's what you do in a crisis. I wanna add a, just a couple of final lessons here. This lesson five, if you will, also was one that, that those of you as health professionals and the social determinants of health know well, and it's this. Inequality is toxic to social solidarity and mass mobilization. My, you know, there are those climate policy purists out there who say, you know, don't link the fight on climate action to inequality or social justice. Like, this is complicated enough already. Don't make it more complicated. And uh, I think they're wrong. I think they're wrong because, firstly, the connections between climate and inequality uh, are deep. The richer you are, the higher your emission. The poorer you are, either a household or a community or a country, the more vulnerable you are to climate change. But here's the other reason why they should be linked, because that's how we win. A successful mobilization requires that people make common cause across class and race and gender, and that the public have confidence that the sacrifices are being made by the rich as well as middle and modest income people. Interestingly, during the First World War, inequality and, and grotesque profiteering undermined social solidarity. It actually undermined recruitment efforts. So consequently, at the outset of the Second World War, the government understood that and they took bold steps to lessen inequality. Canada's first major income transfer programs come in 
in the Second World War, unemployment insurance, the family allowance. The Marsh Report, which is this incredible commission that lays the groundwork for the whole post-war welfare state, is written during the war and offered up to Canadians as a pledge that the society they came back to would look different than the one they were leaving behind. That's when you get the recruitment numbers. That's when the cross-society mobilization happens. That is how you get everyone on the bus when you're undertaking a, a grand collective enterprise. And the final lesson I want to offer is that uh, it requires leaving no one behind. And for me, this is really an issue of jobs in particular. And this always comes up, right? There are about 200,000 Canadians who are currently employed in the fossil fuel industry. That's a lot of people who need, need to find some confidence that they will not be left behind. But consider this. In the Second World War, over 1 million Canadians enlisted in military service, and more than a million were directly employed in military production, far, far more than are employed in fossil fuel industries today. All of those people had to be recruited and trained up and then reintegrated into a peacetime economy. And to do that, again, the government created these audacious programs of income support and housing support and post-secondary programs that completely transformed the face of the post-secondary sector in Canada for a generation and changed the lives of thousands of people. If we could do that then, we can do that again. Um, just as the Second World War ended the Great Depression, as we rebuild from this pandemic, an ambitious climate plan with massive green infrastructure spending, a Green New Deal, can be just what the doctors ordered. The vital and urgent challenge now is to ensure that we use this experience and the opening it creates to catapult our societies into a post-carbon economy. As Aaron Daddy Roy urges, this pandemic like past ones should be seen as a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We, we must not return to yesterday's normal with all of its inequalities and fossil fuel reliance. I, I wanna highlight a notable difference between the pandemic and this climate crossroads moment. People talk about COVID fatigue and all of you as health professionals know that it's real. And, and some have responded to my thesis by saying, you know, look how quickly we tired of emergency in this pandemic. It's been less than a year. And now you're asking that we spend multiple years in emergency mode to tackle the climate crisis. But here's the distinction. The things that we're called upon to do in response to the pandemic are anathema to all our social instincts. We're told to isolate, to stay home, and that's hard. And here's the good news about the climate mobilization. It calls on us to do precisely the opposite, to get out there and do something grand together. And a final thought before we open this up for discussion. Like many of you, as I read the latest scientific warnings, I'm afraid. In particular, I feel deep anxiety about the state of the world that we're leaving my kids and your kids and grandkids, uh, all of us who take seriously these scientific realities wrestle with despair. That is the ambiguous time in which we live. The truth is, we don't know if we're going to win this fight, if we're going to rise to the challenge in time. But consider this. In the Second World War, from a population at the time of about 11 million people, as I say, over 1 million Canadians enlisted, that is a remarkable figure, isn't it? Yet it's worth appreciating that those who rallied in the face of fascism 80 years ago, likewise, didn't know if they would win. We often forget that there was a good chunk of the war's early years during which the outcome was far from certain. We know how the story ended. They did not. Yet that generation rallied regardless. And in the process, they surprised themselves by what they were capable of achieving not just on the battlefront, but at the home front too, and the complete transformation of the society and social relations that they brought about in that time. That's the spirit we need today. Thanks. Let's talk. Um, 
I don't know how you clap on uh, on Zoom, but uh, <laughs> we'll love for everybody to clap together after that uh, glorious presentation. Thank you, thank you, Seth. Um, wh one one question that I've been I've been burning with after reading your book, uh, the statistics you had just mentioned about the number of airplanes, three airplanes a day being built in Canada and a ship every three days. I, it, it's unbelievable to even imagine these these numbers. And and now we've got a country that can't find masks for COVID or COVID vaccines, and we've got to search all over the world and, 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 and try to find these things. We don't seem to have the ability to do this. Can we get from here to there? I mean, so this is part of, I think, the legacy of neoliberalism is that it sort of have, it's eroded our sense of possibility and our, our sense and our ability to do those things. And yet, at the beginning of the Second World War, we didn't know how to do these things, right? We had to, rec like you talk about the ships, we didn't know how to build ships. We had to recruit uh, naval engineers from the States and from England to come and then recruit and train up a whole bunch of people, men and women, who, who had to learn for the very first time. Uh, and yet they did. Uh, one of my favorite examples comes from from our American friends. Like when I say to people sometimes we should just ban the sale of fossil fuels as of 2025, people say, oh, that seems too, sh that, there's no way you could do that in, in, in four years. Consider this. Pearl Harbor happened in December of 1941. In February of 1942, two months later, the last civilian automobile rolled off the assembly line in Detroit, and for the next four years, they were illegal. Um, now, that didn't happen because the big three were super patriotic and did it out of their own goodwill. It happened because they were ordered to do so. Um, but the, and, and you know, granted, the Americans had a few years to kind of prepare for what was coming, but it is still remarkable. Um, but, you know, Larry, I mean, I, I mentioned this in the conclusion of the book, like often when I've shared my thesis, when I was writing, people would say like, you know, that generation, they were tougher than us. And, uh, you know, that they, they just had this can do ability to rise to these moments. And, you know, maybe we're softer or whatever. And maybe there's some truth to that, except in the end, I think we become the people that circumstance require us to be. We've all sort of had a taste of that the last 10 months, haven't we? All right, I'm going to read the next question. So I think what we'll do is we're going to be alternating between chat questions and questions that people sent in already. So I'll just read out a question from the chat here. Um, Tim Trainer is saying, your book is an excellent clarion call and recognition of Canada's true potential. Which of your four markers is the biggest challenge in terms of engagement of political leadership and gaining public acceptance? I mean, I've already, look, I've already distilled 400 pages into four markers and now you want me to prioritize my four markers. They're really important, they're all important. Um, uh, and interestingly, Biden is starting to hit them, right? He's talking, he's, he's speaking some truth about the fact that these industries have to be wound down over the next 20 years. Uh, he's creating new economic institutions like a civilian, uh, climate core. Um, uh, he's setting firm dates by which certain things have to happen and the amount of spending he's proposing. This is why I say Trudeau's off by an order of magnitude tenfold. If you were to take what Biden's proposing, convert it into Canadian dollars, so like divide it by 10, he'd still be spending 10 times more than we are. Uh, in some ways, that first one, spend what it takes, is, is a hard one, um, especially because people think, oh, now with COVID, we've spent so much, which is why I, I actually think you know, looking at what's happened in the pandemic, and in particular, the role of the Bank of Canada, right? Like the, the Bank of Canada since March, since the first lockdown, has been buying up $5 billion of government securities a week. The Trudeau government is proposing to spend about $5 billion on climate action a year. Um, so there's your contrast. Um, and, you know, some people might think, oh, well, that means we, we've, we've, you know, spent all the money. I don't think it shows that. I think it just shows what's possible. Because, um, in fact, the level of spending needed for climate is less than we've been doing this year uh, in response to COVID. 
And the crown corporations is a hard one. Again, I come back to that neoliberal legacy. It's not that it should be hard, but it's it's just that people no longer we've been trained to to rule it out as a possibility. I mean, you could say the same thing. Like, why didn't the Trudeau government um, create a you know a crown corporation to manufacture vaccines ten months ago? Um, although interestingly, they did in Britain and they did in Australia. Um, so, you know, a lot of our leadership is just trapped still in this straitjacket, this neoliberal straitjacket that constricts their sense of what's possible. By the way, the third one I actually think is the easiest, moving to mandatory measures. Th think about the pandemic again, right? You, where you've had the public crying out to their politicians, bring in the mandatory measures, right? Because people feel like I'm trying my hardest and it kind of pisses them off if their neighbor isn't, right? It's the same in climate, I think. A lot of us want to do what we need to do, but we don't want to be chumps. And we feel like, what's the point if I do it if my neighbor isn't? Which is the liberation that comes from mandatory measure where, we, where in the end, you don't need to worry about your neighbor because your neighbor's not going to have a choice. Um, so I actually think that's an easier sell. Some great questions in the uh, the chat box from uh, Deborah Curry. Uh, do you see any business sector actors in BC or Canada who might be galvanized by the climate crisis and who might fill the shoes in the climate change movement, such as C what C.D. Howe did in the Second World War? Yeah. You know, I'll tell you, I I have... Let me let me make, give you a roundabout answer. First of all, I you know I I loved landing on this World War II frame when I was writing the book because it was helpful to me and it and it jolted my own thinking. But it's only been since releasing the book in September that I've really come to appreciate how remarkably resonant this story remains eighty years later. And so many people, you know, there's people in that story that are important to people's sense of purpose and so on, including in the business sector, and. I've really enjoyed the fact that the books allowed me to connect with different audiences and make a little mischief with them, including business audiences who I've really enjoyed talking to uh, with the book. And my message to them is this, right? Look at what the business sector did in the war. You know, they, they pivoted and, and engaged big time in, in wartime manufacturing. Of course, thousands of them enlisted. Um, they helped to sell victory bonds and, over a hundred of the top executives in the country became C.D. Howe's dollar a year men. So they basically, uh, w uh, he, they got tapped by Howe to head up these crown corporations and to serve as controllers and for all of the supply chains. Um, so what did those business leaders do? They actually abandoned their private sector posts for the duration of the war. And this is what was remarkable about including people who are like icons of the of the era in business, right? H.R. McMillan, Woodward, they all did this. They were dollar a year men. And they and they and in talks they gave to their fellow business people, or men as they were at the time, they disabused their fellows from any notion that to achieve the speed and scale required, it had to be state led. So when I look at the private sector sort of green climate private sector today, I see a lot of fantastic innovation. I see a lot of stuff, you know, green tech stuff that we need getting produced. But here's the problem. It's a side hustle compared to the speed and scale of what we now need to achieve in the next 10 years. It's got to have to be state led and we need business leaders saying to their fellow business leaders, come on, this is what it's going to take. I just want to right, add to that. Oh, sorry. sorry. Go uh, ahead, Larry. I, I just, uh, I was looking at the biggest corporations in, in Canada, and the 10 biggest corporations in Canada are all either banks or oil companies. So can you get these big companies to do your bidding, like the dollar a day people in C.D. Howard, or do we have to go down the list uh, from companies 11 to 20 or 20 to 30? So first of all, in terms of the campaigning we now need to do, one of them, and there is there are emerging campaigns on this, is targeting those banks to say stop being financial enablers of the expansion of fossil fuels. 
we need them to be part of divestment and they need to feel that pressure. And the good news is, while they are all heavily invested uh, in, in the fossil fuel industry, the, it is not the largest part of their operations. They can afford to pull up stakes. Um, with respect to the fossil fuel companies themselves, it's a different conversation that has to be had. And um, one of the things I'm saying in the book is that we have been held back by political leaders who are still, to put this in uh, Churchill versus Chamberlain terms, uh, they're still preoccupied with trying to appease the industry. Like, look, in our province, we have, you know, for Clean BC, we have a, a, a the government has a, a Clean BC uh, climate advisory group. Um, there's a bunch of good people on that. Uh, there are also two fossil fuel reps on that, one from Shell and one from Tech. Now, I'm sure they're very nice people, but uh, they shouldn't be there, in my view. Um, because what I'm saying is, at this late hour, because these groups tend to operate by consensus, trying to come up with a, fossil, uh, a climate plan with which the fossil fuel companies can find comfort isn't a climate plan worth having. Not now. We've run out the clock. Uh, and they should be removed. A question that was submitted um, earlier by email. So this person is saying, I've only read half of your book and I'm of course so impressed, but I'm wondering how loss of biodiversity fits into your plan for climate action. So I don't, I don't deal with it. That's the truth in the book. I, I'm fairly singularly focused on, on, uh, on how we eliminate our GHGs, but I think they're intertwined. And I think many of the solutions uh, that we need to undertake with respect to climate will also hand in hand uh, speak to biodiversity. Then this for me is part of the appeal of the Green New Deal. And, and not only in, because, like I've argued, it links inequality, uh, fighting inequality with, with tackling climate. But when you look at the sort of social infrastructure that the Green New Deal calls upon us to invest in, public child care, free post-secondary education, elder care, and the caring economy. To me, winning those things is about shifting the balance in all of our lives and as a society between what we pay for on our own or what we're expected to pay for on our own and what we pay for together. And when I think about the pressures in our society around earning so much money and consuming so much and all of these things that are at the root of the biodiversity crisis as well as the climate crisis. To me, the Green New Deal says to that ethos, um, you don't need to make as much and consume as much um, because you know the pressure you feel to pay for your, your children's uh, childcare, chill out, we're gonna do that together. And, you, and the pressure you feel to like make so much money and, and uh, for, for your child's post-secondary education or your parents' elder care or your own, your own retirement, relax. We're gonna do more of that together. Let's alter the balance. Um, interesting question from Graham Brock. Um, I, wonder if, I wonder if there was such widespread skepticism of scientists and politicians by the general public in World War II. I think the battle for truth is the underlying battle that must be won. Social media has become a toxic influence and echo chamber for deniers, probably instigated by those profiting off the current system. Do we just ignore the doubters and mandate change? We do ignore the doubters and mandate change. Um, here's, uh, Here's the good news out of the polling I've seen and, and some of which I, I commissioned for the book from Abacus. The, those who believe, who are outright climate deniers uh, and who just reject the notion of, of human-induced climate change are a diminishing rump of public opinion. They are not our, our, our main barrier to what we have to do. Um, Far more problematic and insidious is what I call the new climate denialism, right? Which is those, all of, and that's widespread in society and in the media and in industry and in government, those who say they get the science and yet continue to practice a politics that does not align with what the science says we have to do. 
so so that's where I um, where I focus um, my attention. You know, it's true. Social media is not something we had to contend with then. But the point I'm making in the book is that you know whether it's the war or the pandemic or now the climate emergency. You know, what is the alchemy, that combination of events and leadership that shift the zeitgeist so that enough of the public is in emergency mode and ready to do what has to be done? And we all just lived with that like 10 months ago, right? We all, we all experienced denial in the early days. And we all heard about the cases and thought it was somewhere else and it wasn't really going to impact us until it did. And we can all think about what it took when our own mental sense of this shifted right for a lot of people it was the cancellation of the nba season now i don't even watch basketball but i remember that and i remember thinking whoa this is different um and i also know that it mattered to have the prime minister giving a press conference every morning in front of his house and that starts to shift zeitgeist remember that in the war the bulk of the population was not at all keen especially in the united states by the way in 1939, a majority of Americans did not believe the U.S. should enter the war. That public opinion shifted about 20 percentage points before Pearl Harbor. And a lot of that was about the role of the media, in particular Edward, Edward R. Murrow and the CBS News team are credited with a lot of that shift. So again, when you have a media that understands the crisis and its role in, in an historic moment, they can tell the truth too and they can shift public opinion. So I actually think, you know, just to give you another campaign, I've, I've already suggested that you doctors take on uh, banning fossil fuel advertising. I think there's another campaign there directed to the CBC to tell cli more climate truth, right? I say in the book, if we, can, if we can get hourly morning reports on the radio on business and sports, surely we can have a morning climate emergency report telling us how this battle of our lives is unfolding at home and abroad with our allies in here every day, how it's going. Great. From someone who deals with the media a lot, I, I you know, anyway, I'm being open to taking that campaign on. Right on. Um, <laughs> there's a question from Vanessa Burchick. Sorry, Vanessa, if I pronounced your last name wrong. Um, Hi, she, Vanessa. Bursick. Okay. <laughs> um, she says, hi, Seth. She's worried that COVID is presenting a fork in the road, one towards the portal or transformation we hope for, or a second, which is the destabilizing impact of the pandemic and isolation that will push people to want what they had before. Um, she worries about that the second possibility, given the profound negative impacts of the isolation measures on mental health inequalities, will, will kind of turn us towards that second possibility. What are your thoughts on this? Every historic moment can go either way. Um, and that was true in the 1930s, too. And all of the despair, despair people felt then, the economic despair, um, gave birth to both the rise of Hitler and the promise of the New Deal. Um, either are possible. And the quality and kind of leadership that we have animates one or the other. That's why I say it's a leadership challenge, too. Um, your book largely addresses mobilizing for the climate crisis federally. What are recommendations to activate our environmentally dishonest provincial government for the climate to mobilize for the climate emergency? Well, the book, I think, uh, actually deals with all levels of government. Um, and, and there is a critique of BC and clean BC in the book. Um, and when I say that, so I, the book specifically spends time dealing with the federal plan under the federal liberals and clean BC uh, under the BC NDP. Now, why do I pick on BC and, and that? I actually pick on it because it is the high water mark. The federal plan and the BC plan are the two most aggressive climate plans we have in the, in the country. And yet, neither of them come close to being climate emergency plans. So that's why, to me, they represent these clear case studies of what I mean by the difference between what we've seen to date and a true emergency plan that hits the four markers, right? Is BC spending what it needs to be spent? Not close. Clean BC is spending a fraction of 1% on climate programs. So not even close. 
Uh, is it creating new crown corporations? Actually, it's not created a single new crown corporation. Uh, is it um, hit marker three? Is it moving to mandatory measures? Well, sort of. It says we're going to ban the sale of new fossil fuel vehicles by 2040, and that all buildings, new buildings, will have to be carbon zero by 2032. So it's setting it's setting dates, but the dates are completely out of whack with and communicate the opposite of emergency. Um, and are they telling the truth? No, they're not telling the truth. Um, so all of those things need to change. I want to um, read out this interesting question um, from someone, Helen Kettle. She's saying, is there analysis that shows that our economy can actually be run without fossil fuels? For example, where will all the electricity come from to run electric cars? Absolutely. Here's the good news. This is not a technical problem um, uh, or a policy problem. This is about political will and courage. Um, so the technology that we need to electrify and decarbonize pretty much everything is already there on the shelf, um, at least up to about 95% of it. You know, there's a few little things around the, a few production processes we need to figure out and air travel is in particular the big question mark in all of this. Um, but as for the rest of it, it, particularly in BC, where we have the incredible advantage of already having um, uh, renewable energy for electricity. And, you know, a lot of people think, oh, well, if we electrify all of our home heating and electrify our, all of our vehicle transportation, it's going to re require a doubling of our electricity generation. No, it won't. Um, first of all, electricity is so much more efficient than the combusting of fossil fuels as an energy source. Secondly, the newer, like modern heat pumps are so much more efficient than a conventional electric baseboard heater. Um, uh, and also, re re appreciate for a moment that a huge chunk of the electricity we're already producing and plan to produce is simply to power uh, fracking and LNG. So if we aren't going to proceed with those, <laughs> that all becomes freely available. So are we going to need some new electricity generation capacity as we electrify everything? Yes, we are. Not nearly as much as most people assume. And our ability to do that in a dispersed way with energy neighborhood utilities and rooftop solar and, um, and, uh, and in particular, uh, dispersed wind power uh, can easily achieve what we need to achieve. So that isn't actually our challenge. Um, question from um, Brent, Brenda Mark. Do our constitutional rights to health and safety not mean anything? you want to comment on that as a direction we might head? Well, I mean, there's lots of campaigns that are trying to make the legal case for action um, and, and casting it in a, in some cases, in a human rights framework, whether it's as you described or for young people and their right, you know, it's sort of intergenerational right to, to um, life uh, and health. Um, and I think those are all great efforts. Um, and I'm, but I, I worry that they won't be successful in time. Because uh, everything is about the next few years. All right, there's someone here, um, Trevor Hancock, who's raised his hand. I'm just going to let him, uh, I'll give him uh, like an actual verbal question here. Go ahead, Trevor. Trevor. Thanks. Hi, Seth. The question is picking up on your point uh, about having less and using less. And, and when you look at the uh, need to reduce our ecological footprint to the equivalent of one planet, which is what we have to do, that's a 75% reduction in our footprint. And it means a whole lot less stuff of all sorts. Mm -hmm. um, and my question, which I actually put in the in the question box, but I'll read it very quickly, was um, a lot of industries will be gone, or at least they'll be dramatically reduced. And one answer, of course, in terms, because I, sorry, I preface this by saying that in wartime, of course, 
essentially had full employment. Everybody was being employed. Um, that's not going to be the case here in the sense of the old notion of full employment or even close to it. One answer is to move to more labor intensive production, but then we live in an age of AI and robots. So, so what do we do? I actually think it is going to be result in full employment, at least for the next 20 years. Um, the task is great. Um, and, uh, and what we need to do and what we need to invest in as we decarbonize and electrify everything tends to be particularly labor, labor intensive. This is the thing about the fossil fuel industry. It's fantastically capital intensive, right? So when you think about for, for every, uh, million dollars of investment, how many jobs do you get? The fossil fuel industry ranks at the bottom in terms of the number of jobs produced. And many of the things that we now need to do, building retrofits but, uh, and, and renewables, but in particular, so much of what we're talking about with the Green New Deal is the caring economy. It's stuff that is service-based uh, service as opposed to material throughput, to come to your first point. And these are inherently more labor-intensive industries, right? Where do you get the most bang for your buck in terms of employment? Healthcare and education, that's where. Um, uh, so... Uh, I actually think we are going to have more jobs as we make this transition. But the key difference will be, will all of those jobs pay the kind of six-figure salaries that uh, some in the oil patch have come to expect? No. And that's why I say this is about shifting what we expect people to pay for on their own and what they then often uh, spend it on to providing more collective goods in the form, uh, well, collective goods and most importantly, collective services. Um, and, and we need to use, and, and it's about economic redistribution, right? I mean, there's an awful lot of that material throughput overshoot is, is uh, wealthier people who are spending ridiculous amounts of money on things they don't need. So uh, in a society where others have great, uh, great need, um, so uh, it also involves that shift as well. A question from uh, Marianne Reva, political expediency question. How do we change the political will only months after majority provincial government has been voted in for four years? Mm -hmm. It's hard. I mean, I am a, a, a big fan of minority governments. Uh, always have been and have argued for proportional representation um, uh, uh, for many years for exactly that reason. Um, and yet, uh, you got to work with what you have. And if the political pressure is strong enough for, and, and the quality of leadership is good enough, even that is possible. You know, it's interesting in New Zealand where they have proportional representation, we had the labor uh, government of, of Jacinda Ardern, who kicks our butt when it comes to climate action and on the pandemic. And then just a few months ago, she was rewarded politically in their election and achieved an outright majority. So she previously was head of a, a minority government in coalition with Greens. Now she has an outright majority. Now that almost never happens in a PR system in a proportional representation. So that is an indication of how she has been politically rewarded for being bold in the way that she has. And what does she turn around and do? She brings the, she brings the two green leaders into her cabinet anyway, <laughs> even though she didn't have to. Um, so, you know, it is possible to change a culture and to, and to set those expectations, but I certainly believe that climate action would be easier the more we maintain minority governments and produce outcomes of minority governments. But I also think this is about electing more climate champions uh, and increasing the size of the climate squads in multiple political parties and at all levels of government. And I do actually think that while it's true, you know, I would have been happy to see the BC government returned as a minority. They have a majority. They also elected more climate champions. And now we need to hold them to account to do what they have to do.
Yeah, right. I'm going to ask a quick question, maybe just one more before our time is running out. It's from Kelly Lau, and she says, thanks for the inspiring talk, Seth. She's wondering where strategically the health voice could be used to influence political will. Like in terms of mandatory measures, could Bill C-12 be a way to force the government into action? Yes. Well, I see her already doing that in, in her article in the Georgia Strait. Um, and th thank you for engaging in that way on, on C-12. So um, you've already done what I would advise. Um, all of these, on, on all four, so C-12 is an important part of marker three. Um, and so on all four of these markers, we need an active and animated voice of health professionals bringing the, you know, wearing your health hat, uh, uh, demanding true emergency and playing as you do with the lessons from this pandemic, as well as the lessons of the war to say, um, and as you did, Melissa, off the top, right? This, you're making the case that this is the ultimate uh, example of how you, you discharge your, your obligations as medical professionals. And now this is what you're obliged to do. Seth, um, uh, on behalf of the group, I wanted to thank you for a very inspiring talk. The um, uh, attested to by the, the the number and quality of the questions in the chat box. I, I don't recall ever seeing such interesting questions in, in anybody's chat box. Uh, this is a this is a reflection of the the quality of the talk that you gave. Um, I would also recommend that everybody read this book if they haven't uh, done so up to now it's a it's a it, it's a great read and i'm starting on my uh, my second time on the way the way through um I, I appreciate the way you've answered some of the the questions particularly my concern has always been um why are we dealing with inequality at the same time as climate change like you have brought up uh, climate change is like a big enough fish to fry why do we have to deal with all these other problems at the same time and you've given a really credible answer to to this question and i i really thank you uh, for this we thank you for this thank you larry and by the way i i was negligent i just put a link to my book page for people who want to get the book if they don't have it already and i also put a link to that article i promised about the four markers from uh, an article I had in Policy Options in November. Thank you. And and one of the biggest inspirations I get from Seth is talking his book is, is gives us gives us things to do. One of the biggest problems with climate change it can it can drive people it can force people to inaction. They get so frustrated, the problems are so overwhelming, they don't know what to do. To have a concrete uh, a roadmap like like seth has um, has given us is just uh, it's just amazing so thank you very much again thank you have a good night everyone thanks for coming